morning, everybody. Uh, we are pleased to welcome back today uh, the first person we had on Lusk Perspectives uh, roughly six weeks ago, Neeraj Sood. Um, as you will recall, Neeraj is a uh, distinguished professor here at the USC Price School. He's the vice dean of faculty here. He is a senior fellow at the Schaefer Center. Um, but what you may not know is since he first spoke to us about six weeks ago, he has turned into a rock star. And so I like to feel like I'm the Clive <laughs> Davis of um, epidemiology because uh, Clive Davis is the person who discovered Janet Joplin among other people. Uh, he is now, uh, his, he, his work has been uh, featured in all the major newspapers. He's testifying before various legislative bodies. He is working closely with Los, Los Angeles County uh, as it has been and with its ongoing response to COVID. And so he is really in the thick of things. And so we really appreciate that he's taking out some time for us this morning. Uh, Neeraj Sood, thank you for joining us again. Richard, thank you for that uh, introduction. Uh, and oh, I do have and some slides. Of, so. and, and just one bit of housekeeping is, if you have questions, please post them in the Q&A box. You will see at the bottom of your screen. And I will, after Neeraj gives his talk, uh, moderate a conversation with him. So. Sorry, Neil Rich, with that, please take it away. So I think uh, last time I, I talked with you, uh, we, we talked about uh, the op-ed uh, that I published in the Wall Street Journal. So I'm not gonna go over uh, the points we, we made in the op-ed, but since then, uh, what we've done is uh, we've conducted a, a seroprevalence study in Santa Clara County on April 4th. And then um, we conducted a seroprevalence study in Los Angeles County on April 10th. And actually, we just completed the second wave of the Los Angeles County study on um, May 12th. Uh, one of our uh, MLB tested about 25 employees in 25 different cities, and they've shared their data. So we are working on analyzing the data uh, from the MLB. Uh, we are planning seroprevalence studies of first responders in LA, uh, of uh, children, of uh, people in nursing home populations. These are all special populations uh, that LA County Public Health is interested in understanding. And uh, numerous counties and cities have reached to us and uh, we are basically uh, sharing what we learned from these studies and sharing not just what we learned, but uh, sharing uh, the challenges we faced in conducting these studies as they launch uh, their own studies. So what have we uh, learned so far uh, from these studies? What we've learned is that the number of confirmed cases of COVID-19 are a poor proxy for the true extent of the infection in the community. Uh, the early studies or in the earlier part of the epidemic, the true extent of the infection uh, based on confirmed cases could be, or the, you know, the true extent of infection could be 50 times higher than the number of confirmed cases. And the reason for this was early in the epidemic, we had a lot of cases, but we were not testing individuals. We were only testing symptomatic individuals. Over time, uh, this gap between confirmed cases and the true extent of the infection is going to reduce or is going to narrow as we ramp up testing. Uh, so this number is in some sense not a fixed number and it's, it's a function of how much underlying testing there is happening uh, in the community. Uh, we've got a lot of comments about, uh, you know, are these results valid given the accuracy of the tests and uh, given non-response bias, uh, which is that not everyone invited to participate in the study participates in the study. Uh, so the results of wave one were published in a, in a leading medical journal called JAMA. Uh, so in that sense, they have, uh, you know, they are peer reviewed uh, and the results are robust. We discussed these issues with the peer reviewers, uh, but we're still learning more. So 
uh, we are learning more about the accuracy of the tests and we are learning more about new uh, statistical methods to adjust for non-response bias. So the results might change over time as we you know, use new tests or use new techniques uh, to account for non-response bias. Uh, the other thing we found from these studies is that a lot of those who were infected uh, did not experience symptoms consistent with COVID-19, such as uh, fever with cough, fever with shortness of breath, loss of sense of uh, smell or taste. So it says uh, there are a lot of people who, who don't who are asymptomatic in terms of these uh, symptoms. Uh, the loss of sense of smell or taste seems to be the most important predictor of uh, infection across uh, these multiple studies. And finally, the infection rates uh, vary by geography, income, and race ethnicity. So in some sense, you know, an aggregate number for LA County masks or for any community, any large county might mask a lot of uh, differences within the county, uh, depending on uh, what neighborhoods you live in, what your income level is and race ethnicity is and so on. So uh, now, uh, what do the results from these studies mean uh, for public policy? Uh, so I think the first implication is that uh, the mortality rate and hospitalization rate estimated based on number of confirmed cases is going to be higher than the mortality rate and hospitalization rate uh, estimated based on number of confirmed or number of estimated infections uh, using these seroprevalence studies. So what we need to do is use these new estimates of uh, or ranges of mortality rates and ranges of hospitalization rates and update our models and, and disease forecasting models uh, to see what would happen in the future as you change uh, the underlying input in, into those models in, in terms of the mortality and hospitalization rate. And since the mortality and hospitalization estimates are going to be revised downwards, uh, what it would mean that the chances of the virus overwhelming the healthcare system are lower than what was initially assumed or forecasted. Uh, the second thing this means is that contact tracing is going to be more challenging uh, for two reasons. One, there are many more infections uh, based on the seroprevalence studies compared to the number of confirmed cases. And second, a lot of those infections might not have the classical symptoms of COVID or might be asymptomatic. Uh, so the traditional strategy of testing symptomatic individuals with fever and shortness of breath or fever and cough uh, might not be as effective as we think. And finally, all like not just this studies, uh, but now there have been several efforts in across the nation. So other than kind of New York and the Northeast, in a lot of these studies, seroprevalence has been in the 3 4%, 2% uh, range. So what that means is there is still 98% of the population that's susceptible. Uh, and we think, you know, herd immunity might be achieved or the epidemic might end when like maybe 60% of the people get infected or 60% uh, of the people are vaccinated. So this means that when we think about public policy decisions for COVID, we cannot have a two month time horizon. This epidemic is not gonna end in the next two months. We need to have a much longer time horizon in, in making these uh, policy decisions. So I think the time horizon should be, you know, at least 18 months, two years till the time we have a vaccine or uh, we achieve herd immunity in some other way. So uh, now just some uh, additional thoughts on policy that go kind of beyond uh, the results of the study. Uh, so the first thing is uh, a lot of the disease epidemic models show that social distancing or lockdowns, they do not change the number of infections over the long run. What they do is change the timing of the infections. So if you don't have a lockdown, you have a high peak. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then the infections taper over time. If, so, so the lockdown is just changing when that peak happens or how big that peak is. 
Uh, so in some sense, the the benefit, the primary benefit of a lockdown is having, this is what flattening the curve is, having a smaller peak so that the probability of overwhelming the healthcare system is reduced, uh, which in turn would reduce COVID-related uh, mortality. Uh, but there are several costs of stringent social distancing or lockdowns. Uh, one is that it increases the chances of a higher peak in the second wave. Uh, so just to kind of give you an example, um, if we have a stringent lockdown for the next three months, and uh, we are able to maintain seroprevalence at three, four percent, and then we uh, let go because uh, uh, we don't have the political will to keep the lockdown or the economic and health consequences of the lockdown are too severe. Uh, well, three months from now, we still have 97% of the population that's susceptible. So now when we have a second wave of infection or a second seed of infection in this community, we're still going to get this much higher second peak or higher peak in the second wave. Uh, but if we had already had 10% seroprevalence, then the second peak would be smaller because the virus would find it more difficult to spread in the community where more people have already had the infection. We should also look at other costs of stringent social distancing. Uh, for example, it might have, uh, you know, reduce our quality of life. Uh, it might lead to other social problems uh, related to that, such as uh, drug abuse or domestic violence. Um, it also has economic costs for uh, households, businesses, nonprofits, uh, governments. Um, it has other costs on healthcare. Uh, for example, uh, people delaying preventive care like cancer screenings or vaccinations or people are not going to their uh, healthcare provider even when they have symptoms that could be uh, treated. And finally, last but not the least, uh, having children out of school can have long-term consequences on their human capital formation and their, uh, their prospects during their lifetime. Um, so I think we need to look at both the benefits of, of uh, social distancing as well as the costs and choose a level of social distancing that maximizes the benefits net of these costs. So in some sense, you know, from an economic perspective or from you know, whenever you look at an optimization problem, uh, one of the things you say is it's very difficult, like it's very rare where the corners are the optimal solution. So which basically says very stringent social distancing might not be optimal and business as usual also might not be optimal. Uh, the optimal path might be somewhere in the middle where we are doing social distancing, uh, but at the same time, we are cognizant of these costs and we are trying to uh, 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 you know, uh, minimize the cost at the same time, you know, trying to increase the benefits. Uh, the other thing is social distancing is, is not the only policy option. Uh, we should look at the costs and benefits of other policy options. Uh, so, for example, uh, in Los Angeles County, 50% of the deaths uh, that occur are in nursing homes. Uh, so one strategy would be to focus a lot of effort on prevention in nursing homes or prevention in other high-risk populations, such as those who have uh, chronic conditions or intergenerational households. Uh, similarly, uh, you know, there are two ways to reduce uh, the chances of uh, overwhelming the healthcare system. One is to reduce the demand, and you can reduce the demand by making sure people are healthy and are doing social distancing. Uh, but on the other hand, you could also reduce the chances of overwhelming the system by increasing supply, which is having more hospital beds, having more ICU beds making sure our healthcare workers are, are protected with the appropriate PPE. Uh, so I think we need to uh, consider all these different options when thinking about uh, public policy. And um, none of these decisions are gonna be made with complete certainty. So I cannot tell you right now what I think or you know, what is for sure an optimal policy. Uh, policy makers or leaders will have to look at all these factors 
uh, we would know we would not know all the costs and benefits with complete certainty. Uh, they will have to evaluate different policies and then and then go with a policy that they think makes sense and be adaptive. So over time, change policies as they learn more information about the benefits and costs and the effectiveness of uh, different policies. So I'll probably stop there and uh, take any questions. Neeraj, thank you very much. I, I guess I, let me start with a, a question about uh, your view that the mortality rate has been overstated by using confirmed cases as the denominator. Isn't there also a problem with the numerator not being measured properly? And I'm thinking in particular, you look at a place like New York and the excess death rate in New York um, at the peak was something like five, which is to say mm -hmm. there was a week in which five times as many people in New York City died than you would expect mm -hmm. in a normal mm -hmm. week based on that mm -hmm. week of the year's average for the previous five years. Yeah. And, and if you look at the number of confirmed deaths, it was a substantially lower number than that excess death number. And yeah. so don't you need to adjust both yeah. the numerator and the denominator? Yeah. Yes, so you need to adjust both the numerator and the denominator. And Richard, you're absolutely right that uh, if you look at, I think starting the last week of March, uh, there is clear evidence that it's not just uh, all cause mortality has, has, has been higher than expected. And I think the, the challenge here is, is twofold, that uh, we need to figure out how much of that excess mortality is because of COVID or because of COVID associated lockdowns. So it could be that some of those excess deaths are because <clears throat> like you, you gave me this anecdote that you're, you know, uh, someone called your wife and said they had a truck on their chest, but they didn't want to go to the ER uh, because they're afraid of COVID. So I think some of, and if you look at data, I was in another meeting where they were presenting data from uh, the LA County ER, and you see a big drop in the number of people coming to ER for a variety of reasons. So I think that's the, the challenge there. And would we ever know how much of those excess deaths are because of lockdown or because just of the fear, like not even the lockdown, even if you open the lockdown, there might be still the fear of going to a doctor and getting care. Uh, so we just don't know that. Um, but I think, uh, what we need to understand is how that number would change under alternate lockdown policies. And it's just, you know, it's right now you can make an educated guess, but this is the point I was saying that there is always going to be a lot of uncertainty about this. And, and we'll just have to make uh, these decisions under that uncertainty. So along those lines, uh, I mean, one of the things I find compelling, I, I was listening to a pediatrician yesterday a very well-known one, who is very concerned about the decline in vaccinations. And she says they're down about 40%. Oh, I'm trying to remember whether it yeah. was her or my wife who told me that. And, and so what is that mm -hmm. implied, what is the more implied mortality rate of people just not getting vaccinated for things they should be vaccinated for? I, Do we have any sense I, of that? I, I don't know of that off the top of my mind, uh, off my head, but I think that's, in general, we haven't spent uh, as much time talking about all these other side effects uh, that we are experiencing. Uh, every day we know what's happening to COVID mortality and COVID cases, but we know very little about all these other things and how big they are and how relevant they are and how they change as we implement different policies. So I think that's in, in general, uh, those things are, are less salient because we don't see them every day and we haven't done a good job quantifying them. So here's a, a question from Lamont Gibson. Um, how should antibody tests be compared in quality? Um, what is their sensitivity, specificity, et cetera? So it's basically how good are they? Which ones are any good? It's how, walk us through a little bit about how would you think sure. about it? Sure. So uh, the, the test, there are two parameters you'd look at when looking at the validity of a test. One is called the specificity, which is one minus, so one minus the specificity 
is the false positive rate of a test. So to just give you an example, uh, the test we used in uh, the Los Angeles County study had a specificity of 99.5%, which means if I test 200 individuals, I will get one false positive. So there would be one individual who actually wasn't a positive, but the test would say they, that was positive. So the chance of a false positive is one in 200 or 0.5%. The other measure of a test is the sensitivity of the test. And one minus the sensitivity is the false negative rate of the test. So that says uh, if someone actually has um, COVID, and the test or has COVID antibodies, but the test doesn't recognize that. And the test uh, basically calls you a negative. Uh, so our test had, uh, my dog wants to come in <laughs> the uh, meeting. So the other test had, <laughs> uh, uh, our test had a sensitivity of around uh, 20%, sorry, of around 80%, uh, which means uh, if we test 100 people who were uh, positive, the test would only identify 80 of them as being positive. Uh, so what do these numbers mean in terms of trying to understand the value of a test? Uh, so for the purposes of our study, all we wanted to do was count the number of people uh, who were potentially infected. So as long as I know the false positive and the false negative rate of the test, I can adjust my formula. So I can, I can look at the percent who tested positive and convert it into a number, which would be the percent who truly have COVID antibodies. So for that, all I need to do is some math with uh, the false positive rate and the false negative rate. So we did that math for the LA study. So you know, if the percent who tested positive was 4%, after you adjust for the false positive and the false negative rate, the percent who would have antibodies, we estimated that to be around 4.3%. But if you wanna use these tests to make healthcare decisions, then uh, it's a different issue because then you don't want to call someone a positive if they really don't have the antibodies. So you know, they're uh, calling someone a false positive uh, test is in some sense more problematic than a false negative test, because in some sense, without testing, we are all presumed to be negative anyways, and we take precautions. So, and by the way, I think I read in the Lancet some years ago that a dog entering a video meeting extends everybody's life expectancy by five minutes. So I think, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I'm gonna skip the queue a little bit because Elizabeth Salvi has a, a follow-up to your most recent answer, which is just how does the specificity and sensitivity of this test compare, for instance, to the flu test? I, I don't know the sensitivity and specificity of the flu test. Um, okay. So I, you know, I know of the test uh, we looked at. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think the implication is, is, is what you're doing is undercounting. Given the sensitivity and specificity, you're actually undercounting the number of true cases. Mm -hmm. that so just the, so the, sensitivi the sensitivity, the low sensitivity implies we are undercounting. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the 0.5%, so the higher the specificity, like if the specificity was lower, then we would be overcounting right. because we would have more false positives. Right. So um, from Rita Lundberg, um, she, she picked up on your statement, that the chance of cases overwhelming the system are lower than thought. And she says, so how does that explain Italy, France, and New York City? Um, surely the healthcare systems in those places were overwhelmed. Yes, the healthcare systems in those places were definitely overwhelmed. And uh, all I'm saying is that these estimates imply that the chances of the, I'm not saying the system might, would not be overwhelmed if we had 30% seroprevalence uh, very quickly. The system would be overwhelmed even with the new estimates. What, what I'm saying is uh, early on, we had estimates of, uh, from the WHO that mortality would be three to 4%. Uh, that would imply systems getting overwhelmed very quickly. Uh, 
these new uh, studies imply mortality estimates that are much lower than that, uh, ranging from 0.1 to 0.7%. Uh, so that would imply the chances of the system being overwhelmed are lesser. And the second is, uh, we cannot extrapolate these findings. So I'm not saying take the findings from LA or Santa Clara or Indiana or wherever all this testing has been done and extrapolate to other uh, places. You need to, uh, the strain of the virus might be different in different places. So how contagious it is might vary by geography. Uh, population density varies. Uh, the stage of uh, the underlying health of the population varies. So there are a lot of different factors that might explain why uh, a virus is more deadly or more infectious in certain areas compared to uh, others. And as I said, like right now, we, we still, there's a lot of uncertainty about this. Uh, we still don't know a lot of things about the virus. So we cannot explain accurately why, you know, what are the factors that led the virus uh, to overwhelming the healthcare system in New York and Italy, but not in so many other locations? Like, why didn't it overwhelm in Iran? Why didn't it overwhelm in India, in Bangladesh, in so many other places? So we, we, we don't have a complete understanding of this. So, well, along the lines of a not complete understanding from Donovan Knowles is the following question. There have been talks about the possibility of the virus mutating because it is RNA allowing for there not to be an effective vaccine similar to that of HIV. Is there any truth to this? Again, I'm not an immunologist, so I don't know. Uh, what I've heard from immunologists is uh, that you know, a vaccine will take time, but uh, there is a good chance of having a vaccine. But again, you should take that with the caveat that I'm not an immunologist. This is just secondhand knowledge. So um, from Harish Chatiani, um, with many asymptomatic carriers out there and the likes of Disney and other businesses, including airlines, using temperature to allow access could we not be allowing a surge in cases? And I assume by that requiring people to have their temperature taken before they enter the park of the airplane. Mm -hmm. um, what percentage of the U.S. population do you expect will eventually be infected in the next three months if no vaccine is introduced? So what fraction is infected will depend upon what we do over the next three months in terms of uh, what practices do we follow uh, in terms of opening up the economy. And, uh, and, you know, again, like the question is, when you think about public policy, you got to think about the long run. So you have to say, are we going to be in a stringent lockdown for 12 months? Or what is our plan of action? So one plan of action would be to have a stringent lockdown for a certain amount of time, uh, reduce the reproductive number of the defective reproductive number of the virus to below one, and then gradually and safely start opening up the economy. Um, also to segment the risks, which is take care of the nursing home population, which accounts for 50% of the deaths. Um, so I think there are just a variety of different strategies to do, but let's not look at, so I can say, I'm pretty confident if you open up the economy, the number of cases will rise because this is a contagious disease and it will spread to more people. The question is, uh, what are our other options? Uh, how long can we you know, sustain a stringent lockdown? What would be the cost of those stringent lockdown? So I think we have to do this balancing act where we are trying to uh, minimize uh, all the costs of the lockdown, uh, but at the same time, we don't want to overwhelm the system. So we are trying to open in a way that doesn't overwhelm the healthcare system. Yeah, so I, th I think I, I, I'd like to, we had a conversation yesterday about the following. So suppose you get the R of under one, which is to say that the average person infects fewer than one other people. And what I asked yeah. you is that would, would that ultimately lead to the death of the disease? And you replied no. And so if you could explain yeah. that a little bit. So, like, for example, right now in L.A. County, we think we are approaching an R less than one. 
So if you have a, a R less than one, and right now we think our sero prevalence is around 3%. Uh, so if R is less than one, uh, and we continue with these measures, the, the disease might, you know, so the disease will start dying down and maybe it'll die down by the time we have a sero prevalence of 5%. So, so now what do we do after that? Do we continue to stay in this stringent lockdown and keep R below one? But if you've achieved that and the disease has now stabilized, that it's not increasing, say, beyond three, four, five percent of the population, and then you open up, when you open up, you still have 95 percent of the population that's susceptible. And if you get someone who has COVID re enter this population or seed this population with COVID, we will have a second wave of infection. So, and the second wave of infection is larger the more susceptible people you have. So if you have a population where only 50% of the people is, are susceptible and you put a seed in the population, you've already in some sense achieved herd immunity because 50% were already infected and that epidemic doesn't take off. But if you have a population where 95% are susceptible, you can stay in that lockdown for six months. But the moment you open it, if 95% are susceptible, there are greater chances of having a second wave. So the safest thing, if you just cared about COVID mortality and nothing else, is to stay in a lockdown till the time you have a vaccine. That is the safest thing. If you just care about COVID mortality. But if you care about all the other costs of a lockdown, including health, quality of life, economic costs, then that doesn't seem like a sustainable strategy. That we cannot be in a lockdown for the next two years. So now the question is, how do you close that gap? And, and the same thing, we cannot do business as usual because we've seen business as usual will lead to a big spike in infections and it will lead to a lot of unnecessary deaths. So we need to find some strategy between lockdown for the next two years versus business as usual. What is that strategy? And what strategy would be optimal? No one really knows that for sure. We need to experiment a little, monitor, figure out uh, what, what that optimal might look like. And that optimal will be different for different locations because it might depend upon how contagious the virus is. It might depend upon how good your healthcare system is. It might depend upon how good the underlying health of your population is, uh, what is happening in your economy, a lot of different factors. So we, we need to make that decision under uncertainty. So I, I can't. Uh, so so one of the most interesting facts out there about the disease right now is Singapore has a, as of yesterday or day before yesterday had a, 22 deaths out of 28,000 cases. So that's less mm -hmm. than 0.1 percent. And so yes. what makes Singapore different from the rest of the world? So so beyond the fact that they have um, their incidence is pretty low. Yeah. but not given their population tremendously low, but that very low mortality rate is quite yeah. extraordinary. Yeah. I, I, I don't know uh, why uh, they have uh, experienced uh, much lower mortality than um, other parts of the world. And I think the mortality rate is also going to change over time as we learn more about uh, how to handle this disease. Uh, for example, uh, there were reports that individuals from hospitals were, uh, who had a COVID infection were transferred to nursing homes where uh, they spread that infection. Now we know that is, and the, the reason they did that was they were trying to prevent infections in the hospital, but transferring that person to a nursing home probably led to many more deaths. Now everyone understands we should not be doing that, and that was a bad strategy. I think now everyone understands a lot of the infections are coming from nursing homes and congregate settings. Uh, we have better technology for testing individuals and getting re results more rapidly. So I think that's going to change the mortality rate over time. Uh, a lot of physicians and healthcare providers are figuring out how to treat this disease, like whether or not to use anti anticoagulants, uh, whether or not to use ventilators and when to use ventilators. So I think over time, even if we don't have a vaccine, we're still going to reduce mortality 
by figuring out these other ways of better managing this disease. So, you know, and, and, and here's a good follow-up again from Dr. Lundberg. Um, did the Swedes perhaps have the right approach to create herd immunity among children by keeping the schools open, but unlike Sweden, take much better care to protect the nursing home and other vulnerable populations, yeah. thereby increasing herd immunity, but not achieving it at the cost of high mortality? Mm -hmm. So I think there is this thought there that one strategy is to have the low-risk population uh, be infected so that we can develop herd immunity and at the same time uh, invest heavy resources in protecting the high-risk population. Um, so protecting the elderly, protecting intergenerational households, protecting nursing homes. And, you know, I think that's a strategy definitely worth uh, considering. So from, and, and I'm, I'm not following it, so I'm going to ask... Uh... Lamont Gibson, if I can find him here. And I, I guess I'm not, the, the question he typed is, what assessment adjustment is made for similar but different, i.e. less lethal coronaviruses? And I, I guess I'm not quite sure what, what's meant by assessment adjustment, but I... Um... So I think maybe uh, the thing he's referring to is uh, the false uh, positive rate of the test. So uh, if, the, if, if the test is... Uh, picking up other coronaviruses, uh, that would be a false positive. Um, and as I said, like we've, uh, you know, we think the, based on the data we have about the test, the specificity of the test is pretty high at 99.5%. So just to kind of give you an example, uh, we sent about 110 kits to the FDA uh, to ask them to test the test kits. Uh, so they put 80 known COVID negative samples into the test kit and the test kit said all 80 of them were negative. Uh, so the false positive rate there was zero. Uh, the FDA put 30 known COVID positive samples and the test kit picked up 28 out of the 30. So that would imply a sensitivity of 93%. Uh, but the sensitivity does change um, over time. So uh, the sensitivity is lower early when you are infected because your the number of antibodies are low uh, and the sensitivity increases uh, at like the two week, two week mark where uh, you there, there's a much greater chance that you have a more robust concentration of antibiotics. In terms of cross reactivity to other coronaviruses, it also depends upon you know, where you get your COVID negative samples from and what the underlying prevalence of these coronaviruses is, is in those populations. And we don't know a lot about that. So it could be that there are some false positives because of cross reactivity. And some people think that's actually a good thing because that might show that, uh, that you could have some potential immunity because you have antibodies uh, that are reacting against multiple coronaviruses, including the new one. So it, here's, a, a, I think, a really good question, and I don't know if you will know the answer, um, So I, I, but I, I'm going to put it out there anyway. So we, so we know in the U.S. African Americans are dying at a higher rate than other racial and ethnic groups. Is this a uniquely American phenomenon that there's one race slash ethnicity that's dying at a different rate from others? Or do we see this in other parts of the world as well? I, that's a great question. I don't know the answer to, uh, to it. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I thought it was kind of it. unfair to answer it, but to <laughs> ask it, but it was such a great question on the off chance yeah. to do the answer. I wanted to ask it anyway. Yeah. So, so this is something we, we should find out. It's, it really is a great question, <laughs> but yeah, we, we don't know. Mm -hmm. Oh. Okay, well, um, that is, that's it for the questions we have before us today. So uh, again, Neeraj, thank you very much for coming back and updating us on what you've been up to since we first spoke uh, uh, it was roughly six weeks ago.